stories from my mom about the bees my grandfather had when she was a girl growing up on a sheep farm in Richland Center. They had to keep the hives on the porch during the Great Depression to keep them safe from desperate neighbors. How they could trade their sugar rations for other things like shoes during World War II because they had their honey. My mom was one of 14 kids, so shoes were a big deal. After a lot of research, I started with one beehive in a friend's field. I placed those bees in an old dried up orchard of about a dozen apple trees. Those tree, uh, bees brought those trees back to life and they're still producing now, years later. I worked for the Postal Service for 20 years and finding time to work my bees was always an issue. It took me years to successfully overwinter my bees. I understand how important it is to keep trying even though it is very discouraging when you lose your bees every year. I eventually moved my beekeeping into our yard Bees, chickens, big garden, the whole deal. I was only ever a hobbyist beekeeper, and the most I ever had at one time was two colonies. In 2017, we semi-retired, sold everything, including my bee equipment, and moved to Florida for a couple of years. While we were there, I noticed the state of Florida had bee inspectors on their state job site. I'm like, how do you get that job? Beekeeping is hot work, and I didn't want to mess with the Florida heat. I was a letter carrier my last five years at the Postal Service, so I understood fully how hot working outside can get. We moved back to Wisconsin in 2019 to help family, and my daughter wanted to finish high school here. Last spring, I saw that Wisconsin was hiring apiary inspectors. I only had one entomology course, but I do have a bachelor's degree in anthropology from UW-Madison. I was hesitant to apply without any other coursework in bee sciences, but at least I was an experienced beekeeper. I applied anyway. I started this new job in May. I spent the summer traveling all over Wisconsin meeting bees and beekeepers. With my anthropology background, I like to say I find the beekeepers as interesting as the bees. <laughs> there are different types of beekeepers and they each have different relationships with their bees. Commercial, sideliner, hobbyists, and novices. I try to understand what each person is trying to get from their bees so I un can understand where I can be of benefit. Pollination, selling honey, selling bees, citizen scientists, or pampered pets. How can I be an asset to each beekeeper? We all need to work together to promote bee health. My job is bee health, but all insects are in trouble and need our help. Habitat matters for everything, big and small. Healthy food, a safe place to live, and clean water. I'm grateful to have a job where I can make a difference. Thank you for joining me today, and once again, I want to ask you to hold your questions until the end. The apiary program is one of the oldest programs in the Ag Department, it's dating back to the 1890s. Our program is housed in the Plant Industry Bureau in the Division of Agriculture Resource Management. In some states, honeybees are considered livestock, so the apiary program is in their animal health division. But in Wisconsin, invertebrates are excluded from the definition of livestock. So the program is in the Plant Industry Bureau. This is broadly what the apiary program focuses on over the year. Each new year, our state apiarist, Francis Haggerty, mails out honeybee import reports to package producers and other folks that are bringing in or causing to be brought in bees into the state of Wisconsin. And this is based on the statutory requirement that says anyone causing bees or comb or bee equipment to be brought into Wisconsin needs to first report the shipment to us in writing along with a certificate of inspection. We have two seasonal inspectors who start up in mid-April, first looking at the incoming packages and then moving on to primarily hobbyist inspections through August. In the fall, we focus on pollination services and migratory beekeepers Almost all of our inspections are, we do, are voluntary and requested by the beekeeper. I am the Eastern Apiary Inspector. My summer inspection territory is highlighted in blue on this map. I am the sole inspector November through April. I also have a secondary appointment for outreach and education over the winter months. This smiling gentleman is Patrick Sizemore, our Western Apiary Inspector. Patrick's appointment runs May through October. The DATCAP apiary program offers free voluntary inspections to all Wisconsin beekeepers. Inspections are scheduled on a first come, first served basis. Pratik and I are each responsible for 32 counties. 
We interact with beekeepers one-on-one, -on -one, over the phone, by mail, at the bee club meetings, county fairs, and online. We try to cover the state as best we can, but we ultimately go where the inspections are requested. Here's a map of the 2021 inspections. In 2020, we inspected 141 beekeepers, opening 2,400 hives. In 2021, we inspected 287 beekeepers, opening over 2,300 hives. Since 2011, Wisconsin also participates in the USDA bee survey. We collect 24 samples of bees and pollen across the state to help monitor for pests and diseases. Beginning in 2014, a pollinator protection plan was developed in collaboration with the University of Wisconsin Department of Entomology. A diverse stakeholder group was assembled to provide content and guide plan development at three separate stakeholder meetings. 30 stakeholders representing a range of agricultural, governmental, tribal, and nonprofit organizations participated in the development of the plan. Wisconsin's Pollinator Protection Plan was released on Earth Day 2016. Although the comprehensive plan is lengthy, highlights of the plan were summarized in a one page Best Management Practices, or BMPs, targeted at specific user groups beekeepers, farmers and growers, lawns and gardens, and prairies, roads, and open spaces. Scientifically grounded, Wisconsin focused, and voluntary. The overarching goals for the plan are to improve public understanding of pollinator health, identify actions anyone can take to help and increase communication, expand the quality and quantity of habitat for managed and wild pollinators, minimize stressors on managed and wild pollinators, increase managed honeybee hive health and survival, and increase outreach on pollinator-friendly practices. This portion of the presentation contains recommendations for gardens and lawns outlined in the Pollinator Protection Plan. Why help pollinators? If you help pollinators, they'll help you. Pollinators aid seed production for 87% of the world's flowering plants, including 75% of the world's leading food crops. This includes the wildflowers and food plants in your garden, including things like sunflowers, peppers, tomatoes, fruit trees, herbs, berries, and many more. Pollinators need the right places to live and the right foods to eat. In 2019, the value of pollinated crops in Wisconsin was 230 million, honey accounting for 6.5 million. Pollinators increase our nation's crop values each year by more than $15 billion. A pollinator is any animal that visits flowering plants and transfers pollen from flower to flower. Most of our animal pollinators in Wisconsin are insects like bees, flies, butterflies, wasps, and beetles. We have one bird that visits flowers, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Bees are our most efficient pollinators because they purposely collect pollen to feed their young. Most other pollinators are transferring pollen accidentally as they move from flower to flower. Here's a picture of the domestic honeybee on the bottom left and a picture of a bumblebee on the bottom right. There is a large ball of orange pollen stuck to the bumblebee's leg. When people think of bees, they often think of honey, but the honeybee is just one of many species of bee. In fact, Wisconsin is home to roughly 400 species of bees, including 20 different species of bumblebees. Domesticated honeybees were introduced from Europe in the 1600s, while most of the other bees in Wisconsin are native to North America and perfectly suited to pollinate the native plants. Each bee species has unique feeding and nesting traits. Pictured here, top left and bottom right are bumblebees. Top center, a green sweat bee. Top right is a mason or carpenter bee. Bottom left, a polyester or cellophane bee. And the bottom center is a leaf cutter bee. Some of these bees are who will nest in your man-made bee houses. One of our pollinators with special concern is the rusty patch bumblebee. It was listed as an endangered species in March of 2017. The rusty patch bumblebee population has declined by 87% in the last 20 years. The species is likely to be present in only 0.1% of its historical range. Since it was listed, there have been survey efforts to find populations, and the most observations of this bee have been in Wisconsin. 
So it is critical that we all do what we can to help save this pollinator. Unlike honeybees that live in large colonies, wild bees nest alone or in very small groups. Except for bumblebees, most wild bee species are solitary, meaning that each female bee creates her own nest to lay eggs in. 70% of wild bee species live in the ground, while 30% nest in hollow stems or dead wood. It's important to note that solitary bees are docile and rarely sting. In fact, you likely have solitary bees in your yard and don't even realize it. Most native bees spend the winter in their nest cells as pupa, emerging as adults the following spring or summer. So it is critical to protect nesting areas from disturbance all year long, not just during the nesting season. One exception is bumblebees, which do not overwinter in their nests. Some bumblebees are not solitary and live in colonies, but their colonies do not get as large as honeybees. Bumblebee workers die at the end of each year. Only the fertilized queen overwinters and starts a new colony from scratch in the spring. Bumblebee colonies can reach a few hundred workers, while honeybee colonies can reach into the tens of thousands. Honeybee survival depends on large stores of honey to get their colonies through the winter. Bumblebees only have to make a tiny amount of honey to sustain their colonies through the breeding season. Bees rely on pollen and nectar for food. Pollens vary in nutritional content. Bees do better where a variety of selection of flower species are in bloom. Nectar contains carbohydrates for energy and fuel for the adult bee. Pollen contains proteins needed for the development of young bees. We like to say nectar is like the sports drink to bees, while pollen is like their pot roast. Small bees may only travel a few hundred yards from their nests, while larger bees can go up to several miles. Most bees prefer not to have to travel very far to get a meal or to provision their nest, so it is important that a good diversity of flowering plants is available nearby. Your yard may be a small bee's whole world. What are some of the things that you can do in your landscapes to benefit pollinators? Probably one of the easiest things you can do to improve pollinator habitat is to leave things a little messy. Wild bees nest in old rodent burrows, cavities, abandoned bird nests, hollow plant stems, down logs, and leaf litter. Some pollinators need access to undisturbed open ground for their nest sites. Another improvement you can make is to plant bunch grasses like little blue stem. Bumblebees and solitary bees will nest under the tussocks. If possible, avoid disturbing existing bee nests. They may look like anthills, so watch for who's occupying the nest before you destroy it. Even predatory wasps can be beneficial as long as their nests are not in high traffic areas. They like to go after the garden pests that you'll find chewing on your vegetable plants. We recommend you use caution with homemade or store-bought bee houses. They can harbor pathogens if not properly maintained and may be colonized by wasps and other insects. The Xerxes Society provides guidelines for creating homemade bee nests on their website. Choose plants that are suited to your geographic region, soil, and climate conditions. Include flowering plants native to your area. Native plants tend to attract and support more pollinators and are usually lower maintenance. Many pollinators are plant specialists and will only be found where their preferred host plants are present. The Xerxes Society and the Pollinator Partnership have regional planting guides for flowers that bloom throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Many native insects only reproduce on their one special native plant. Avoid flower varieties that are double flowered or otherwise highly modified by breeding. These flowers often have little pollen or nectar and are difficult for bees to navigate. Pollen production and nectar are often bred out of these flowers, leaving them useless to most pollinators. Many gardeners want to see butterflies in their yard. So it's important to remember that most butterflies require special plants. For example, monarch butterflies on the left and the endangered carner blue butterfly on the right. Adults of both of these species will nectar feed on many types of flowers, but as caterpillars, they are both very picky. Monarch caterpillars only feed on milkweed plants, and carner blue butterfly caterpillars only feed on lupines. Aim to have at least three flowering plant species blooming in each season 
spring to late fall. Not just flowers, try to select a variety of blossoming herbs, fruits, vegetables, trees, and shrubs. Choose a variety of flower colors. Bees are most attracted to blue, white, yellow, and purple flowers. Butterflies are drawn to orange, red, yellow, and purple. Flower flies prefer white and yellow, and hummingbirds are particularly attracted to red. And let your herb garden bloom. Pollinators love flowering mint, lavender, basil, oregano, garlic, chives, and parsley. And don't be afraid to let dandelions, clover, and other flowering plants like Creeping Charlie bloom in your lawn. These plants provide an important food source when most other plants aren't flowering yet, and the bees will thank you. Before applying chemicals to your lawn, mow to remove clover or dandelion blooms that might attract pollinators. This will help limit direct contact. By the time the clover or dandelions grow back, there should be fewer chemicals present in the pollen and nectar. Before applying any pesticide, whether they're insecticides, fungicides, or herbicides, assess the damage and identify pests. The University of Wisconsin Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic has resources to help you identify pests and determine if action is warranted. Pay attention to pesticide labels that say highly toxic to bees, toxic to bees, or extended residual toxicity. These products and mixes are less toxic to pollinators. And choose products and mixes that are less toxic to pollinators using available online tools. The University of California Integrated Pest Management website has an online tool to look up pesticides by name. It will return the information on the pesticide and give you a score for how toxic it is to pollinators. Pesticide applicators can then choose products and mixes that are less toxic to pollinators. If you're using a pesticide in your yard or garden, remember that the label is the law, so follow directions exactly. Immediately report suspected pesticide-related in bee incidences to Wisconsin Dat Cat Pesticide Program at 608-224-4529. Do not apply insecticides on two plants when they're flowering or to areas where pollinators may be nesting. If a pesticide advertises that it protects for 12 months, it is likely systemic and should not be used on some blooming plants that are highly attractive to pollinators. Pesticides that are systemic migrate throughout the whole plant and can persist in the plant soil for weeks or months. The more neighbors protecting pollinators, the bigger the impact. Education goes a long way. A conversation or a well-placed sign can change someone's mind. Is this landscape neglected or planned? There are many opportunities to participate. The links on this slide will take you to some helpful resources. Participate in the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge, Advertise your pollinator-friendly lawn. Learn to identify honeybee pests, wild bees, flies, and wasps. And prepare and participate in citizen science projects. The other topic I wanted to cover today is beekeeping. Beekeeping is a rewarding venture, but new beekeepers may easily become overwhelmed by all the considerations that go into keeping bees. Habitat loss, nutritional deficiencies, pesticide exposure, Parasites, pathogens, and harsh weather are some of the main causes of concern for bee health. Parasites, improper nutrition, and pesticide exposure are all, are all compounding issues that can make colonies more susceptible to pathogens and decline. The following practices are recommended to improve overall pollinator health and to minimize, minimize hive loss in managed bees. Most of these practices apply only to the most common managed bee, the European honeybee, but some also apply to bumblebees kept for greenhouse pollination. Apiary location plays a big role in overall hive health and performance. If possible, select a south-facing site that receives plenty of sunlight with a northern windbreak. Try to avoid low areas with little airflow and stagnant puddles. Space hives out as much as possible, preferably next to natural landmarks like shrubs, trees, roads, and field edges. If your hives are in town, be sure to check with your local municipality for any beekeeping ordinances. And be neighborly. If you are considering keeping hives near property lines, communicate your intentions with neighbors 
and be sensitive to their concerns about stings. Open communication and education is the best way to get nearby farmers and homeowners to help protect your bees. Honeybees need a diverse diet. The best way to ensure adequate nutrition is to place beehives in areas where at least three species of flowering plants are in bloom at all times from early spring through late fall. Bees also forage for water and will visit whatever source is closest to their colony. These sources can include ponds, streams, leaky outdoor faucet taps, bird baths, dog dishes, or the neighbor's pool. During hot weather, honeybees use water to cool the colony by fanning and evaporating water droplets inside the hive. It's a good practice to provide a clean water source for your bees so they don't become a nuisance. And check your hives often to make sure your bees are bringing in nectar and pollen. When food is scarce, or if they're still active in the late fall or very early spring, provide a pollen or protein substitute and a sugar syrup. You may want to provide protein patties and a carbohydrate source when there are not enough flowers blooming throughout the year. In late fall, add sugar or candy board to any hive that has less than 100 pounds of honey stored going into winter. There are many do's and don'ts when it comes to successfully overwintering bees in Wisconsin. Here are some of the things you should do. Assess hive strength before the winter. Small, healthy colonies can be combined and the poor queens replaced. Insulate the hives, including the top. Add ventilation near the top of the hive to reduce condensation. Condensation is what often kills the bees. Um, they keep a tight cluster of a certain temperature and they only heat themselves, they don't heat the whole hive. And that creates moisture. And if that rises up, collects on the top of the hive and condescends back on them, that moisture prevents them from being able to maintain that temperature and that often they'll freeze to death. We also recommend an entrance reducer or a mouse guard at hive entrances in the fall. And keep hives behind a windbreak or move them inside a shed or a barn for winter. The University of Minnesota Bee Lab has an excellent manual titled Beekeeping in Northern Climates, outlining how to successfully overwinter hives in our conditions. Pest and disease management is also critical for successful beekeeping. If you aren't regularly inspecting for and managing pests and diseases in your hive, you will lose your bees. Not only that, your hives, weakened with pests and pathogens, are susceptible to robbing by other neighboring stronger hives, which can themselves then become infected or infested from your problem hives. Some of the same pests and pathogens can also be transmitted to wild bees. Use a hive inspection sheet to track regular hive health assessments, including mite counts, maintenance activities, treatments, and more. You can purchase hive inspection sheets from bee supply stores, find templates online, or create your own. Keeping good notes, it will help you see trends and remember details that you may find relevant at a later date. As you can see in this picture, it was early in the year because my bee suit is definitely not that white anymore. We recommend using Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, to manage honeybee pests and diseases. IPM strategies prioritize preventive solutions to pest problems and decrease the probability of pesticide or antibiotic resistance. It also reduces chemical exposure and contaminants in the hive. It's the responsibility of every beekeeper to be able to recognize symptoms of disease and how to handle and sample colonies for mites and other pests. You can educate yourself by attending bee club meetings, seminars and workshops, or subscribing to trade journals. Every colony in America currently has, has had, or will have Varroa mites. These mites are the number one enemy for bees and are the leading cause of colony death. Varroa mites evolved in Asia on the smaller Asian honeybee. They have spread to all populations of European honeybees except for Australia. The Asian bees can live with these mites. The European honeybee is for the most part defenseless against these mites. Monitoring mite levels at least four times a year will help you to gauge when you need to step in and help your bees manage the mites. And also if your previous management techniques were effective. Pictured here is a mite counting technique called the powdered sugar roll. A half a cup of bees is roughly equal to 300 bees. Nationally, the treatment number is nine mites 
in 300 bees or 3%. But in Wisconsin, with our harsh winters, we recommend trying to keep your mites under 1% or three mites in 300 bees. The conversation with bee health starts with varroa mites, but it doesn't end there. Varroa mites directly kill and weaken the bees. They are also a vector for honeybee viruses. Viruses that didn't previously have a way to spread far and wide are now showing up in more and more places. Controlling varroa mite levels will also help to keep the virus loads down. The picture on the left is a healthy looking worker bee with a varroa mite on her back. The bee on the right also has varroa mites, but this bee is infected with deformed wing virus. A bee born in this state will never fly and only lives a few days. For videos demonstrating techniques for combating varroa mites, visit the Honeybee Health Coalition website. The Honeybee Health Coalition also has a tool on their website to help you choose treatment options for varroa management. The tool asks you questions about your current weather conditions, your bees, and helps you understand your treatment options. This helps beekeepers make confident, well-informed choices while they're learning and so they're prepared as they progress. The small hive beetle is a newer pest for Wisconsin beekeepers. Small hive beetles were accidentally introduced into the United States from southern Africa in the 1990s. Maintaining strong hives with prolific queens is the best way to prevent small hive beetles from infesting a hive. Small hive beetles are strong flyers and can fly several miles to detect and infest weaker, smaller colonies. If beetles are found in a hive, act quickly using integrated pest management to control the problem. Small hive beetles do not reproduce well in our environment, so they are more of a problem in southern states. When harvesting honey, do not bring honey supers that have brood, and therefore beetles, into the extracting facility. The beetle larva will defecate in the honey while eating it, ruining the honey for the, both the bees and humans. There are other challenges to bee health. Know what to look for and how to monitor for bacterial foul brood diseases. The mottled appearance of live intermixed with dead, discolored brood cells could indicate a number of ailments, including European or American foul brood. The foul brood diseases were named for where they were first reported. European foul brood has been in North America since colonial times. American foul brood was differentiated from European foul brood in the 19th, early 20th century. Foul refers to an unpleasant smell. American foul brood is the most damaging brood disease and is highly contagious among bee colonies. The foul brood spores can remain viable in the woodenware for up to 70 years, so burning the infected combs and the equipment is the surest way to prevent its spread. European foul brood is treatable with an antibiotic. Testing kits are available at most bee supply stores. Pictured on the top is the roping test. A dead pupa will pull from the comb an inch long, thick, gluey, ropey strings. We recommend caution when buying used equipment. Used beekeeping equipment can be contaminated and show no visible signs. There are viral, fungal, and other pathogens like microsporidians that can affect bees. Many symptoms of ill health in beehives have no direct treatments currently and will usually disappear with good care good weather, and a strong honey flow. A seasoned beekeeper learns to read the hive, recognize the signs of bee stress, and has several options in mind. Beekeeping is a year-round job, always trying to stay ahead of the problems instead of reacting after the fact. And always be on the lookout in your hives for new, non-native, exotic pests. Top left is the famous Asian giant hornet. Top right is a varroa mite, Pictured next to a tropolalis mite, which isn't here yet. Um, bottom left is an African Cape honeybee. And bottom right is the European honeybee for scale with a smaller Asian honeybee. If you suspect any of these or other exotic pests or diseases in your hives, please contact the DATCAP Apiary Program at 608-224-4629. Over the summer, we received about three dozen reports of suspected Asian giant hornets in Wisconsin. We were able to follow up with all of them. The majority turned out to be cicada wasp killers, and the second most frequent reported ended up being the horntail wasp. If you have a chance to stop by our booth in the trade show, Washington State was kind enough to send each state a mounted specimen of the Asian giant hornet. So come over and check it out. 
Wisconsin gardeners are the eyes and ears and boots on the ground. If you see anything suspicious, please contact our pest hotline at 866-440-7523. Always remember the label is the law. My decides are pesticides. Always read and follow label directions exactly before applying any treatments to your colonies. Take all precautions and wear proper protective equipment. Rotate treatments using integrated pest management to reduce the likelihood of pesticide and or antibiotic resistance. We recommend replacing one third of your old brood comb with new each year. This will help to reduce the buildup of pathogens, pesticides, and antibiotics. As of January 2017, the veterinary feed directive is now in effect. Honeybees are considered livestock. This means that in order to purchase and apply medically important antibiotics to a beehive, a beekeeper will need either a veterinary feed directive order or a prescription from a licensed veterinarian, depending on the treatment required. Beekeepers will need to work with their local vet to establish a veterinary client patient relationship before any orders or prescriptions are issued. We recommend you also register your bees on BeeCheck, an online voluntary commu communication tool that enables beekeepers and pesticide applicators to work together to protect apiary through use of BeeCheck mapping. Pesticide applicators should always check FieldWatch before spraying pesticides. FieldWatch's mission is to develop and provide easy to use, reliable, accurate, and secure online mapping tools intended to enhance communications that promote awareness stewardship activities between crop producers, beekeepers, and pesticide applicators. Migratory beekeepers have additional challenges to keep in mind when transporting bees for pollination services or to southern overwintering locations. Long distance transportation, poor diets, and overwork are stressful for bees. When transporting bees, maintain a consistent temperature, make sure they have adequate ventilation and proper hydration. Feed supplemental carbohydrates, and or protein before and after crop bloom. Always review the regulations for any state that you intend to ship bees into at apiaryinspectors.org. Each year, package bee and nucleus colony suppliers must submit to DATCAP a honeybee import report along with a certificate of inspection before their bees can be shipped into Wisconsin. This law also applies to anyone bringing in bees for pollination services. This form can be printed from our DATCAP website. Listed here are additional helpful resources, the Wisconsin Pollinator Protection Plan. For a full copy, visit the, our website, datcp.wi.gov. Keyword search, pollinator protection. Participate in surveys and keep up with research at beinformed.org. DATCAP apiary inspections are available on the apiary page on the website. Diagnostic guide from the Penn State Expense Extension. Free diagnostic services from the USAID Bee Lab. And register your hives at beecheck.org. And how much time do I have left? I have, a, I have a half an hour. <laughs> All right. So, so this summer, um, Patrick and I are both new, and we started, um, we really didn't know any beekeepers per se, so we, I would personally would go from meeting to meeting, meeting folks and uh, scheduling inspections. Um, so I kind of worked from week to week. And because I was not very good at um, remembering exactly what part of Wisconsin I was in, there were a couple of days where I drove three or four hours from one inspection to another because I, uh, and I really have to, Remember to check my calendar and the map before I agree to things, <laughs> which was a big problem. And, um, but for more the most part, Wisconsin bees are healthy. It's just that it, it's a little overwhelming. There's so many things to learn when they first start. And varroa mites are just another insect that can be managed just like managing bees. But when you have so many other things to learn when you're first starting, they, they seem overwhelming and daunting. And some people think that they can not treat and it'll be fine. In reality, all you're doing is weakening your bees slowly and an untreated hive will eventually die after about two years if they make it through the first winter at all. And it's kind of like a dog with heartworm 
or thing, if you're not treating, those bees are suffering. These mites bite through their exoskeleton to feed directly on their insides. So if these, so if you're not treating, your bees are not healthy or happy. And I think if you're going to be a steward for an animal, you're, it's important to take the best care of them you can. And, uh, and some people are really worried about putting chemicals into the hives, so they have created uh, organic acid-based treatments to treat the mites and things for the folks who, who didn't want a synthetic chemical in their honey. And there has been severe testing on these chemicals to make sure that they're safe for human consumption and they're strict guidelines to the beekeeper about when they can put them on, if there's honey on the hive and if there's not, and those kind of things, so that people can have peace of mind about. So you can still go as organic as possible without putting your bees at risk. Uh, there are a lot of different research projects right now going on about bees. Uh, the interest in pollinators has helped considerably um, there was hardly anyone in the bee sciences 20 years ago. Most of the professors who were there then were aging out of the system. And then um, we had the colony collapse disorder, which brought a light to the fact, and people became aware that how everything's connected and we all need to pay attention. And that has brought a lot of interest into the bee sciences. There are a lot of people doing research. Um, some people use bees as their tool for science, and they're doing higher levels of um, research on diseases and how the brain works and things, and the bees are a tool. And some folks, God help those grad students, they literally sit in front of a beehive all summer for three hours a day, counting bees as they go in and out, and bless the grad students, they're, they're the backbone of science. <laughs> and. Uh, so I really love my job because I get to see bees every day. I missed having bees, and, but having bees can be stressful, and if some people really just aren't cut out to be beekeepers. The everyday worry about these little creatures that you've taken responsibility for, and you can't just sit outside the beehive and, and know for sure what's going on inside. And, God bless those folks. I love it when they do their research and find out ahead of time before they spend all that money and time and effort to learn that maybe beekeeping isn't for them and they haven't killed a couple thousand bees in the process. And for everyone else who you know is allergic or is terrified of bees, the best thing you can do is plant flowers in your landscapes. As many as you can find that you like, they don't always have to be native. Natives are best for the local native, but any flower that has pollen will help the bees. And a lot of the bees do feed on crop plants and ornamentals in your garden. The idea is, you know, in everything in life, moderation. So, you know, if you really need or want that one beautiful plant that, you know, is from Asia, plant it. But just make sure it's not invasive and that it's not going to spread and damage the environment. And, but what we need to do in this country is kind of replace half of our lawns back to a native wild space so that these animals and these insects have places to travel so it's not an isolated island, but they can travel throughout the landscape and benefit. And I think we'd all benefit from a more natural landscape. And, um, Anything else? Okay. Oh, my job. Um, so what I do when I go out is, you know, I meet each beekeeper. I try to understand what they need. If they have a health concern, then, you know, we deal with that first. I, and then otherwise, I, especially like, I like to get to the new folks who are really unsure of their beekeeping. And then, of course, I seem like a genius because, you know, I know more than them. And, <laughs> and uh, so we show them what I look for, what they should be seeing, where they can improve their bee husbandry, give them the confidence that they know what they're doing and that they can, they can do this. And then also to give them someone that they can call when they have questions or concerns or, if, you know, or someone who sometimes can be that friendly face who will be at the bee meeting with them. And 
The other part of my job is I travel, try to get to all the bee meetings that I can, um, which can be difficult. Like uh, I have one next Tuesday in Door County. That same night, they also have a meeting in Milwaukee. And it's like, so I can't go to both of those meetings every month. I have to trade off one to the other. And, uh, and some of the bee clubs are spectacular, big groups full of big speakers and, and great lectures and a lot of knowledge. And some of them are just small little organizations that are just getting started. And you know they're all trying to work together to help promote education for themselves and each other. But I think it's important to join a local bee club because they have the information about your local bees what your bees in your area are eating, what kind of conditions that they're experiencing. A lot of the bee literature online and things is from southern states. And honestly, it's a whole different world keeping bees in Florida than it is in Wisconsin. And even the difference between Walworth County and Vilas County can be night and day. So it really helps to have a local bee club that you can rely on and have a place to go for information. And sometimes you can, you can get, say you had an incident where your queen didn't make it, you might be able to find someone at the club who has a queen for you. And uh, we talk about people making these shady queen exchanges in parking lots and gas stations in the middle of nowhere. But um, when you order bees through the mail, you can't control what conditions those bees experienced. And believe me, I work for the post office. Those bees. And sometimes what happens is the bees get overheated, and that won't kill the bee, but it'll ruin her ability to be fertile. So you will have what looks like a healthy looking queen that you spent a good amount of money for, and she won't produce for you the way you need to. And what's really interesting with me about the beekeepers is they have such different relationships with the bees. The people who are just in it for honey do everything they can to maximize that. You get you know, as much bees working as they can and focus just on the honey part of it. And some folks are, just want to have bees in their yard to help pollinate. And, and, and I've seen some very expensive beehives that are very beautiful in some very beautiful yards in the suburbs. And they really could care less if they get honey. They just want the bees. And so they're interested in making sure that those bees are as healthy as possible and successful. And the, some of the commercial folks, they'll switch out queens three or four times a year if they need to. Um, they're ruthless when it comes to, they could care less if a single colony dies. They focus on the overall picture. For them, it's, it's strictly ag, you know, a job, and they have a whole different relationship with the bee. And, uh, and I just find that fascinating, that this one animal can have this many relationships with this many people and still basically bee husbandry stays the same. Your bees, no matter what conditions they live in, need those basic things from you, a safe place to live, food and water, and to be as healthy as possible. And what kills a lot of our bees is, is our winters. It's just, it gets so cold, and then with the uh, winters we've had lately where the temperatures change so quickly in one day, the bees can't move about the hive, eat, and then get back into a cluster quick enough when the temperatures drop so fast to survive those cold snaps. And the other thing is that um, when it's been really warm, like it was last fall, bees that would normally have been in a cluster and kind of waiting for spring are up and active for many more months longer than they would have normally. So they're going through their food stores rapidly. And so some of them were starving before Christmas. And if a beekeeper doesn't know to check and to keep ahead of them and feed them when they need to be fed instead of on a, 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 some sort of imaginary calendar they have in their brain, your bees can start before winter even started. And we had a lot of people who lost bees this fall for that reason. And now this time of year, say we get a really warm March, but there's no flowers blooming yet, then those bees are going to be very active, but there won't be any food in the environment. So a lot of the bees will starve between March and May because we think, oh, it's warm, they're safe now, they're not gonna die from the cold, but then they'll starve to death. So, and there's nothing worse than when you open your hive and you realize that they starved to death and it was you who killed them. You can't blame it on the mites, you can't blame it on the weather, it was you who, who dropped the ball and didn't, and didn't stay on top of it. 
And when that's one of the reasons I had stopped beekeeping is because that last time I, I opened a hive and I realized that I was the reason they didn't survive. I realized that working 60 hours at the post office really wasn't conducive to being a very good beekeeper. So, but it's one of the things you are so discouraged when you open your hive and you find your bees dead and you're like, I'm an idiot and I am never doing this again. And then a couple months go by and you start thinking about it and the weather gets nice and then maybe, maybe I'll try it again. I think I know what I did wrong or I'll try this differently or... And it's, it's kind of an addiction. And honestly, it can be a very expensive hobby. There are lots of things to buy and you, lots of little toys and tools and things that people want to sell you. But, and if you're in it to make a living making honey, that is a real commitment and you really need to do your research and, and do the math and plan ahead if that's your goal. But as far as, I think it's a great hobby in that you always are learning something new. I know gentlemen who've been five, six generation beekeepers who are in their 70s who still learn something new every year. And so it's, very, it's a very rewarding hobby. And, but like I said, it's not for everybody and it's okay to admit that <laughs> and support you know, your local beekeepers by buying local honey and planting flowers and doing what we can. And how much time do we have now? <laughs> 15 minutes, we have five more minutes, okay. Um, so what else? Um, the apiary program is kind of an afterthought in the plant department. We just have the two apiary inspectors. Florida has, for example, 16 apiary inspectors because they have bees that are active all year long. And, uh, so those people have a much more. And then also in Wisconsin, because our inspections are voluntary, people don't have to, uh, don't have to be inspected unless they want to be. We, we're not showing up at, at the front gate of the farm and, and demanding to see your bees and make sure that you're, you're not spreading diseases and things. So that, I love that part. I, I think it would be a different job if I had to come and, 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 and you know, impose myself upon people who didn't want me on their property. And uh, also probably a little more dangerous. <laughs> but as far as I get stung almost every day, it's one or two is normal. I have had a couple days where I miss a zipper here or there and it's amazing how those bees can find that little bitty space and next thing you know you have a face full of bees. And uh, this summer I was, um, planning on going on a cruise, and the day before, I've got a hat full of bees, and I'm thinking, oh God, I'm trying to squish them in my hair so they don't sting me in the face so I can go on the airplane <laughs> without looking like I've been beaten and battered. And, uh, and But it's amazing is that it hurts so bad for just a second. Um, sometimes I get a little swelling, but not much. But after a day or two, I barely could tell you I was stung anymore. And and sometimes it itches more like a, a, a mosquito bite than anything else. And that is what aggravates me more is sometimes I'll get like an itchy spot that won't stop. But uh, yeah, that first time I had a, a mass full of bees was, was quite shocking. But now I hopefully will remember to zip all my zippers <laughs> and pay attention. <laughs> and uh, a lot of folks like to go into their bee yards with as little equipment as possible. I have always been of the opinion that you should go in fully suited up so you're ready to deal with whatever needs to be dealt with. So if you, like if you come across a hive where the queen has died, uh, sometimes those bees will be more aggressive. And so what normally were nice docile bees, the one time you go out there without equipment will be all angry. And bees automatically go for your breath and go for your eyes because if they're fighting something like a bear, those are the two easiest things for them to attack. So they're gonna go for your face. So if you're wearing only one piece of equipment, I recommend a veil so that you don't have bees in your eyes. But I have always gone in fully suited up, gloves, the whole shebang, so that I can get in and get out and not disrupt the bees any more than I have to. And um, we recommend you try to get into your bees like once every two weeks in the summer. Um, it takes 16 days for, bee, for an egg to go to a queen cell. 
And so if you're not in there every two weeks, you can sometimes have them starting to swarm and things. And um, if the bees are swarming, they're not making honey. So they're making bees. Um, swarming is not good for the beekeeper, but it's what the bees want to do. It's how they reproduce. So, and they will swarm for like two kinds of reasons. They will swarm because they don't like where they're living or they, they think they can do better or they need to do better or say their, their old queen is getting sick or has is, or is, or is died and then they need to replace her. But also, it, when the weather's good, they swarm as a way of reproducing. So they really want to swarm and if sometimes people think that they've done something wrong if they're swarming, but no, if, it's a sign that your bees are healthy and they want to spread out and, 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 and take advantage of the new spring weather so that they can make more bees. And uh, so what's interesting about swarming is when the bees are ready to swarm, they don't want their queen laying eggs. So they'll run her around and stop her from laying eggs and make her lose weight so that when it's time to swarm, she can fly. And when they swarm, the old queen leaves with like two thirds of the bees to go and find a new place, leaving behind eggs and young bees to raise their own new queen and start over. And um, so sometimes you're lucky and you can catch that swarm before it gets very far, or some people put out traps and try to attract other people's swarms. You know, the best bees are freebies. And, uh, and we always say, if you're, if you're planning on trying to catch a swarm, it's important to have your equipment ready. You know, you already have a hive for, to move them into and things, so you're not trying to run to farm and fleet in the afternoon to buy a hive for the, these bees that you have in your garage or whatever. And, um, but, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating science. And there's lots of resources online. When we do use the Internet, I try to stick to university websites or those kind of things because those folks have a reputation behind what they're telling you and always be aware if someone's trying to sell you something that they may not be telling you all the details that you need to know about a subject and um, there's a lot of gentlemen on YouTube who are, are there to show you what they know they don't really have any interest in you learning anything they just want you to keep and that'll be our 40 minutes I guess so now I'd like to take any questions. <laughs>